Oh boy, on today's episode, we're going to be doing a china cabinet flip. And this one is going to be in a French style. I'm going a little more French provincial instead of French country, but I guess it could be a little bit interchangeable depending on how somebody may decorate it. I decorated it with some of the things that I've done in my past flip videos and put it in my booth and it turned out gorgeous. I'm just waiting for somebody to pick it up and give it a new home. I'm also gonna take you along with me in my shop. I'm gonna go over how much money I made last month and how much I've made so far and what has sold and how much I asked for it. So you guys have been wanting this video for a while. Here is the hutch that we started out with. This thing had a lot of damage to the veneer on the bottom. This is a very common problem with things that are veneered, that are old. It just happens, especially here in Houston because of water. So most likely this has been sitting in a garage and water got to the bottom maybe, or maybe somebody dragged it and broke the veneer off the bottom. Who even knows? It doesn't matter. My main thing is that this is a perfect candidate for paint. And it's also a perfect candidate for removing the doors off of it. And I will show you why in a second. But it had gorgeous details carved all around the front there on that base. And it had all of its hardware, which is amazing. I've been finding tons of this kind of federal style cabinets all over Facebook Marketplace for really cheap, which I understand because they are out of date but you can make them look really beautiful see here how that door is broken that made this a perfect candidate for removing the door off and we ended up removing all the panels off of the top which is kind of becoming our signature <laughs> for our booth and for this channel i like removing all the glass doors off of china cabinets because it makes them a little more functional for modern uses you don't necessarily have to put dishes in here. You can use it as a bookshelf in your office or you can use it as a pantry or you can use it as a coffee station in your kitchen. There's so many different ways that you can use these and they're solid wood. They may be veneered with mahogany, but they are constructed of solid wood. There is not any plywood in this thing. <laughs> Thank goodness, because that's what makes it so easy to fix up and redo. And overall, the drawers were in really great shape. It's obviously really gross and dirty, which I don't like filming the cleaning, so I'm not gonna bore you with that. If you're somebody who is really interested in watching the cleaning, I do sometimes film it if there is like a really drastic, dirty mess to do. My husband is taking the door off and he's also going to use a Dremel tool to remove the side panels that are on there that do not open. And that's a really easy project to do. And the Dremel tool can do so many things. I'm gonna see if I can link one in the Amazon store below. As you can see, this is a very easy to handle tool. So I think this works for anybody, no matter what your skill level is or what your hand strength is, you can handle this tool really well. So I wanted to make sure to point that out to anybody who's watching because I really do think that just about everybody could benefit from having a Dremel and you can change the attachments to do different things and I'm not sponsored or anything. I just realized while I was editing this video that we use the Dremel a lot and you guys might benefit from having one. It works really well for little projects inside the house as well, just whatever you need to do to make little cuts. We've used this thing to install vinyl plank flooring as well to cut the planks. We've used it for a lot of stuff, but today we're using it to remove the doors off of here. My husband does a really good job with very precise cuts. I don't, so that is why he takes over on things like this. And he also uses all his tools and his special method he's come up with to remove the door stop that is here that because obviously there was a door there before. So he removes that out of there and it's funny because it looks a little bit like a, like a casing for a bullet, but it's definitely not. It's just a regular little door stop. And now he's gonna take our sander. This is just our regular orbital sander. Our favorite brand for orbital sanders is Milwaukee because the batteries last really long. I think I do have some of these linked in my Amazon store and if I don't, I'll make sure to put some in there for you. They are a pricier sander just because of the big battery that it has. So if that's not something you can afford, you can totally get a sander, an orbital sander from Harbor Freight. It just may not be of the same caliber. It'll still get the job done though. As long as you're willing to sand a little bit longer, that's all right. But 
I also used my surf prep sander in here, which is a, a square headed sander that you can put a um, padded attachment on and I'll talk about that later. But right now, this is the first time that I am using Bondo. Growing up, my dad did car painting and so I've been around Bondo uh, like most of my life and the smell was so funny. I opened the can and immediately it smelled like my childhood <laughs> because my dad was always doing custom car work and collision work and things like that. So I was around it a lot, but I've never actually used it myself. I've seen my dad do it a million times, but I've never actually done it myself. And I know that a ton of people use it for furniture flipping. So I wanted to test it out myself. I mean, I figured I would be pretty good at using it <laughs> just because it's a lot like wood filler and because I've seen my dad do it so many times. But I have to say, if you are new to using Bondo, that there's something you really need to be aware of, which is that the hardener that you put in there gets hard really quick. Now, right here, my husband did a little magic trick. <laughs> he forgot to film cutting this part off, but we wanted to make sure that all of the shelves were flat and not having that jut out there. So he just took our scale saw and used a flat level and created a guide and cut a perfectly flat straight line on there. Now I'm gonna use my surf prep sander for this part. I'm using the surf prep because I need to get nice square angles where I'm sanding over here. Also because this is not a tough sanding job and I don't wanna use a massive sander to get into these detailed areas. That's why the surf prep is really great. It's really good for details. I'll link that below as well, although that is, again, a pricier sander. And then when I came down to the bottom and was sanding it, the Bondo was really thick, so I did switch back and forth between my Orbital and my surf prep sander here. But again, you can use Harbor Freight stuff. You totally can. I just do this for a living, so I need the better tools or else it would take me forever to do all the projects that I do. But if you're just doing projects for your own house, no big deal, you do not need to invest in anything super expensive. Now I'm just doing a light sand on the whole piece. I'm gonna be painting it using some enamel paint, so I don't necessarily have to do this light sanding, but since it had a lot of gouges on it, I kinda wanted to even it out a little bit. My husband's taking the hardware off so we can prep these drawers to be painted, and I didn't sand these. Again, the paint that I'm using is enamel and man that stuff sticks really well to just about anything it also is a stain hiding paint which is why i love using it and once it cures it is so durable again it's enamel like imagine enamel wear or enamel on your sink or toilet like it's a very strong finish and i don't want to paint anything with the handles still on and also these handles kind of left a, a circle line around there so i had to sand it but now it's time to put the Bondo on the really damaged part, which was kind of hard for me to do. And since I was just experimenting with Bondo for the first time, I didn't do a perfect job. But that's okay. It just took a little extra finagling and doing a couple layers and redoing it, which I did not film because you get the idea of what I did. I just put the Bondo on, let it dry for about 30 minutes to an hour since it's humid here. And then you can go back and sand it nice and flat. And all I did was just make sure that it was flat, nothing special. Here's the paint that I'm using. I'm using the color French Beige. The reason I chose this color is because this is the color of my dining hutch. And so many of you have commented saying how much you love the color of my dining hutch and were asking what color it was. So I wanted to do a project where you guys would get to see the color, understand the color, and I knew you'd like it because you've been asking for it. So <laughs> this is the same color that I did in my own dining room hutch. If you haven't seen my dining room hutch, um, you can check it out in my uh, home, my room makeover playlist and my DIY playlist. I have different videos in there of when I have redecorated that room completely with all thrifted items. <laughs> and I also have videos in there where I decorate my hutch with different seasonal decor, which I will continue to do as the seasons change. Like the next one will probably be Easter. I'm doing a bunny and carrot theme in the hutch for Easter and the colors are going to be like a robin's egg blue and orange which I thought after buying it I thought that was kind of funny because that's pretty much the colors I use for fall as well <laughs> so I've got to make sure that it doesn't look very fall to me or else it will be boring when fall comes around and I'm redoing the same color scheme but it does look really good in the room so that's a plus all I'm doing for painting this 
is just going over it once and then letting it dry for about 10-15 minutes until it starts setting up and then I go ahead and start with that second coat right away. Enamel paint has very strict rules when you're using it and the rules that I need you to know before you try it because if you don't do this it's going to ruin your finish is that if you're going to do a second coat you have to do it within about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. If you're in a dry area, I would not do 30 to 45 minutes. I would do like 15 to 30 minutes. But if you wait longer than like an hour when you go to do the second coat, it's going to shrink up and create a horrible disaster. It, I don't even know how to describe it, but it gets like shrinks and gets super wrinkly and crackled all over your finish. So you either recoat it within that 15 to 45 minute mark or you wait three days. So either you're doing it right away or you need to wait three days. Do not ruin your finish with being impatient like I have done so many times. Even when you touch it and you're like, but it feels dry. It will get ruined if you don't wait the three days. So don't do what I've done and make sure that if you're recoding it, you do it exactly to those rules. And it says it on the can in case you forget, you can read the can. It will warn you on there. <laughs> the bottom of this hutch was not perfect. And I like the rustic look of it, but at the same time, I wanted to add some gold and make it look more antique with this roughness, this kind of um, shabby chic look that it has. And it also looks like European antiques, how they're beat up a little bit with a little bit of gold and worn and distressed and things like that. So I am for the first time adding gold leaf to a piece of furniture. I have never done this before. You're watching me do it for the first time and I'm literally learning as I'm going. So of course, none of this is going to be perfect, but I think it's important to share with you because I can teach you the things I've learned and I just want to show you that you don't have to be an expert to try new things. I tried it and it was not sticking very well. I feel like if you want to know exactly how to do it perfectly, you need to watch Katja's videos because I've seen that Katja does tons of gold leafing. My gold leafing was from Hobby Lobby, super duper cheap, but I ended up just using my rubber glove to pat it on there and it created this gorgeous antique, like distressed look on it and it worked out perfectly. The the happy accident, like I, I swear every project I do has something like that. <laughs> it's never perfect because these things are old and imperfect. And I don't like to make my projects be perfect because if I feel like for me, I have kids. If I create a perfect piece of furniture, it's going to get dinged up and then it's going to be really obvious that it's dinged up. So if you create imperfect, distressed, worn finishes, then it's always going to look like that's how it's supposed to look instead of saying, oh, look at that scratch. You're not going to see the scratches. You're not going to see the dents and the dings. You're not going to notice all the things that life has happened to this thing from using it. And I like to use my things. I don't like to own things that just sit there and you can't touch them or use them. So that's my main reason for creating distress finishes so much. It looks lived in. It looks cozy. But it's also really practical. <laughs> and I'm a practical gal. I'm a mom of four. Now I'm going to add some more gold touches to all the beautiful details on here. I'm going for that French country, French provincial look. I want this thing to look even older than it actually is. I'm guessing it's probably from the 1950s or 1960s. But I would rather it look like it's from the 1750s or the 1850s. <laughs> and that's what I'm going for with this rub and buff. I'm just putting it on with my finger inside a glove and then I do the same thing to all the hardware and I'm not trying to get a perfect finish again because I want it to look worn and old and lived in and I don't want people to worry about oh no I, I messed it up somehow no this is for living use it every day enjoy the things that you have in your home and this is something that I'm selling in my booth and so any little thing that I didn't like that was a little bit too imperfect, I made sure to touch up. So you'll see me do some touch-ups here and there, like if I put some gold in a spot where I didn't really want it, or here I'm putting the shelves back in and I kind of scratched it a little bit there since the paint is not fully cured yet. So I made sure to touch up those things that are kind of like, okay, that doesn't look so great. But once this paint is cured, it will never scratch like that ever again. 
<laughs> I love this paint so much. I literally use it on all the stuff that's in my own home. But now all I'm doing is the same thing over and over again with adding the gold to all the detail touches. And then I go over it with some 150 grit, not 220 grit. 220 will not scratch enamel. It will take you forever to get a distressed look with 220 grit sandpaper. So use a 150 or a 120 grit to get that distressed look quicker and without having to wear out your hands as much. <laughs> then I can put my handles back on this piece is still a little tiny bit tacky, and so I'm being very careful not to touch the paint finish to mess it up in any way. Here it is before. It's kind of hard to believe this is the same piece we started with, and it still had its beauty in how it was originally. But I think that in my booth, all dressed up, you can really see how this piece can get a second life with a whole new style. Let me know what you think of the style that I went with down below in the comments section. And here is how I staged it. I have my handmade candles. I have all my thrifted finds and some of my DIYs in there. I think that the yellow color scheme brings out the gold of the piece even more. And I hope that you agree when you see it. I also love the tiny bit of distressing along all of the beautiful edges. I think that it helps to bring out all the gorgeous details in there and make it look old. I want this to look like an old European antique. And I think... I achieved that pretty well. I'm, I'm really happy with it. I priced this at $249. And if that is cheap in your area, cool. If that is high in your area, please let me know because I want to make sure I'm not overcharging. But now it is time to start talking about my booth and that I'm going to go over everything for this month so far. It's only been a couple days, but I have sold a ton of stuff. So here are all the things I've sold, the date they've sold, how much I was asking for it. I'm also going to show how much they take out in commission for their 10% commission and what I end up with my take home. I also have to pay $300 a month for rent, which comes out of this paycheck for the month at the end of the month. So before they cut my check, they take out the $300 out of my profits. That is how that works. But I'll just give you a couple minutes to look over the things that I have listed here on the left, what I asked for on the right, and how much I took home on the far right. Just so you have an idea of the things I'm selling, the things that are selling, I should say, and the prices that I'm asking and how much I'm taking home. I feel like this was just a really lucky beginning to the month because I normally don't sell this much this quickly in this time of year, but it got lucky. I am currently on the way to take some new stuff to my booth today. I had a whole bunch of stuff sell, shell? I had a whole bunch of stuff sell yesterday and the day before that, so I really need to put more. And even the stuff I added yesterday, some of it sold. So I'll show you what I added yesterday, what sold, and what I'm adding today, which I have here in the car with me. Hopefully all this stuff will sell quickly, although today is Sunday and Sunday is a very slow day for my shop. All right, so here's what it looks like when I got here. Some of these things like this purple Easter basket with hydrangeas in it and then this little arrangement here already sold. So it was blank on my bench there. I also have to organize some things because people just kind of messed some things up and moved it around as they were checking stuff out, which is totally okay. But here's how I restocked tons of Valentine's Day stuff today. A lot of this is new to the booth. Some of it was already there. And then I also stocked a new wreath, that yellow one that you see right there. And then this bookshelf, I hate having in here, but it's like my emergency bookshelf. And since my hutches have been selling pretty quickly at the end of the year, I just haven't had a chance to replace both hutches that I normally have in my booth. And I make sure to take up all the real estate I can even underneath this table, which I'm shocked that table hasn't sold yet. But my yellow experiment was an experiment, so... Maybe I shouldn't have done it in yellow. <laughs> I added more books here, organized the shelves a little bit better, moved some things around. I like to group um, genres together or styles together when I can, but ideally I'm going to have a different piece here in the center of my booth. And for now I have my art leaned up against there, but I am going to hang it. And then I put stuff in the drawers here as well, just so I can display even more things 
than what I can fit on this um, hutch right here. And then I moved that picture around to the top of here, the basket, I hung it on the wall, moved a plate that was up there, and then I stocked this wooden basket. Do you remember this from my recent haul? It was really hard not to keep that basket. I really, really like it. But, you know, sometimes you have to make money, unfortunately. This side still looks the same as the other day. And I'm shocked that that wreath hasn't sold. And this painting, they're only $19.95 each of them. Shocking. And then those beautiful little fruits on the bottom. But I did add this umbrella stand, which I hope will sell quickly. I just dropped off an item that somebody wanted me to put on hold for them before I had even put it in my booth yet. So I put that on hold at the front desk. And then I picked up these items because these are going to be sold on my Etsy store. So good news, I'm going to be starting an Etsy shop for all the people who have been asking to buy things that I have in my videos that are not local. So <laughs> this one's going to Arizona and these ones I can't remember where they're going and I have some other things going to possibly Maine. <laughs> so I have uh, a lot of shipping to figure out but we're going to get there. All right, I dropped everything off at my booth and picked up the things that I needed. And now I'm gonna head to the car wash, wash this car up while I don't have kids in here. So it makes it faster and easier. And then I have to do all the mom things for the rest of the day. So I hope that you really enjoyed coming along with me to the shop. I'm, I hope that you enjoyed hearing about all the things that have sold, what I priced them for, what the commission was, what my rent is, all those extra parts about owning a shop that are not talked about as much but are more important than almost anything else. <laughs> I know that I'm not making millions of dollars. Obviously, you've seen how much I made. And um, last month, I made, after paying my rent, about $945. So I'm not getting super rich here. And something that I want to let you guys know is that my main income is from YouTube views, which is great because it costs everybody nothing to watch. And then this is kind of just like extra income that we really need right now. So I'm hoping to raise that amount more as I um, get my name out there a little bit more as far as my shop, like locally with people here in Houston. I kind of branch out of people that are just near the store. But $945 for a month of just dropping things off um, is great for me. And if you're somebody who sees that and says that's not enough money, it's not going to be worth it for me, then maybe start a YouTube channel because the views that I get help cover the fact that I'm charging really low for my prices so that everybody can afford it. So also, if you can't start a YouTube channel, then yes, you can price higher. And if your stores and your local economy is good enough for those higher prices, then you can do that. But I choose to price low so that everybody can afford it and also because um, I'm able to be happy with what I'm getting a little bit extra <laughs> because I mean who doesn't need a little bit of extra cash right now but since I do get paid for my YouTube videos which is my favorite part <laughs> of all of this is going out and shopping and doing all that fun stuff um, that makes up for my low prices I hope that all makes sense to you and um, that's all I have for you today <laughs> I am going to be doing a lot of thrift flipping here pretty soon and I know that I said that I wasn't going to be shopping for a little while for a few weeks but since I sold so much over the last two days I think I am going to have to go shopping this week so that means that my next Wednesday video will be another shopping video so if you like watching thrift shopping make sure you hit subscribe so you can see that next time and uh, I'll see you next time bye if you're still watching, I just wanted to personally thank you so much for supporting our small business. I will see you next Wednesday. We post videos every Wednesday and Sunday. Bye.